Hello everyone, it's me, Russ. Yes, I've been busy with work, but why? I'm self-employed. Somebody's gonna help me on the wall. I am self-employed and it's easy to complain but you know demand is up business has been good and our son and his partner and our granddaughter are coming up so we're trying to save some money so I can take a little time off as well but it all stirs up some of these uh these feelings I just got a cool <laughs> comment on an old video I did a year ago uh, where my wife and I took a whole month w without alcohol. Stopped drinking for a month. I like to do this from time to time, just because I don't like a substance controlling me. And I was reading some things, I think it was like a Facebook ad or something, I got sucked in this rabbit hole of, you know, oh, you know, if you stop drinking for a week, it doesn't really affect much, but if you stop drinking for a month, then you start to realize more energy and, your thoughts are clear, there's less brain fog, and so my wife and I did it, and uh, no, it's <laughs> really, that didn't work out. It was, we were still, you know, after a month of not drinking, it really didn't feel much different, but I learned a lot. You learn a lot from yourself when you cut ties with a relationship with a substance, I found. Um, something you kind of learn to rely on maybe a little too much, you know what I'm saying? Emotionally. Uh, and th this record right here is, is what this whole thing reminded me of. Pink Floyd, The Wall. This, my relationship with this piece of music, something, you know, over the years that uh, I've, it's been a good thing for me. I mean, back and forth. <laughs> this is a first issue copy, by the way. It's pretty beat up. I bought this used as a teenager in about 1983. Um, and I've had, this is the same, this is the same one. It's one of the oldest records I still own. And it really is a, a heady, heavy, emotional uh, piece of music, you know? Putting my headphones on and just devouring this, you know? And for me, it's been some of this, you know, just existential untangling over the years. As I've, you know, as time passes and you hear this music, over and over again throughout different seasons and stages of your life, right? Like, have you ever felt like that? Like, it's just like... Well, would you look at that? It works! We've all kind of felt like that, right? Haven't we? You know, you get the mundane kind of groove of things and uh, and then life starts to feel a little bland. I think we've all kind of felt like that. But where does things like that come from? You know, that's some of my curiosity about life as a guy who's uh, in the past has struggled with substance abuse. Depression, major depression is uh, on my medical record along with PTSD and ADHD. I've had a lot of help for the PTSD and PTSD is one of those uh, psychological things that's actually the easiest to overcome. And I feel like I, I've done a lot of work on that area, not uh, waking up in the middle of the night, panic attacks. Um, I used to like barely be able to sleep. Like if a mouse came in the room and farted, I would wake up. Like that's how I used to be. Not so much like that anymore. I'm not so much hair trigger angry as I used to be. Um, so I, and that's because of the work I've had to do. Not necessarily had to do, I I could say get to do. It's been very difficult um, moving beyond just sobriety. This summer would be 34 or 35 years now that I haven't used um, cocaine 
and methamphetamine, which were, were things I was very addicted to um, as a younger man. Met my wife and, and she really helped me and, and valued me and I valued her and, and we had a little girl, you know, and got married and trying to work all that out. But, but beyond just being sober, I had to deal with my, my demons, so to speak. I had an arrest record. I had rehab, been to jail a handful of times. Have I been guilty all this time? time? Spent some time in jail, spent some time in the hospital. That will learn me, right? I went from like four to six weeks in a 12-step recovery program to get the alcohol, just to get off the sauce, right? To then going into crack cocaine and methamphetamine, which wasn't better. Somewhere my ability to love and be loved was freaking broken. As far as staying sober was concerned, I, I wasn't good at it. And I kept, felt like I was failing at it. And my value, I felt, in that community was all about staying sober, staying off the drugs, being in this community. Um, and if you did, you, you came in to the group and talked about what a piece of garbage you were. It, it, the value, my, my self-value was, was to a place. So the difference between guilt and shame, all right? If you do something bad, you feel bad about it, right? And then you make a course correction wanting to change that behavior. But when you feel shame down in your bones, it, it's, it's not about that. It's about I'm a fuck up. I'm bad. I'm not, I can't change. You know, you start to f believe that about yourself because it's not out there. It's not just a behavior, a thing that you do. It's you, like you feel your, you start to feel like you're garbage. That's what the feeling of shame does. All right. I know the English language is weird. <laughs> you know, I feel shame because I did something wrong. Um, Shame becomes the identity, and that is what is toxic. So, you know, for me, yes, I learned a lot of great stuff in some of that 12-step community, but there was a lot of damage, and there was a lot of sick people leading groups and having bully-like energy, and it's another brick in the wall for me, man. It's true. I don't carry a chip around, you know, and and I don't tout my sobriety. It's like one of those birds that you saw, you know, in the Exxon Valdez or one of these oil spills and they're all covered with oil and and they they go to someone to get the oil cleaned off of them because they don't like that. Right? Like I didn't I didn't like it. I did like it, but Right? See, that's the, the tricky thing, is that addiction, the relationship we have with it, it's not just that you like it, it's that you build a relationship where you need it, and it it consumes you, it, it owns you a bit. You, you don't own it, it owns you. Records are something I enjoy, but if I stop paying my bills, right? If I don't pay my mortgage because I'm buying records, that's a problem, isn't it? Like, it's okay to enjoy something, but then realize when it's taken possession of you, so to speak. I have seen the writing on the wall. In the recovery community, and listen, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm attacking the recovery community at all, because I, I respect that community. Um, they save people's lives. Where I have issues with it is where, you know, sobriety becomes the, the biggest 
thing that you need to achieve and accomplish. I think sobriety is a byproduct for me. What sentenced you to be exposed before you? I'm gonna address the questions that he had in the comments of that video. Is it the Thracian? There's no I. Is the I? No, there's no E, A after it. E, but I don't know. I'm not. I failed at English. <laughs> it's the only language I speak. I'm not great at it. So do you feel like major depression or bipolar, he says, question mark, and, you know, and uh, ADHD led you to substance over abuse? I'm not sure what that means totally. Um, but so going back to the, the idea of recovery or sobriety being a byproduct or a side effect of, of dealing with one's stuff all right um and there's a lot of there's a lot of research out there all right you could go down rabbit holes like i have um but there's a lot of evidence to support the fact that addiction is birthed out of anxiety and depression it's something we use to treat it um, this idea of fighting my demons or, or he's got a demon he's, you know, bouting with or wrestling with his demons. And you hear these words. And I, I think for me, there was another artist who had good language for that too. It's, it was more like letting my demons free. All right. Because I'd had corralled them behind a wall. And that's where this record comes in. Because some of the artistry, you know, going through therapy and stuff like that. Like, I had a really, really rough childhood. I'm not going to spare you the, the gory details. But um, this this record coming out, before I, you know, really knew what was going on with me at the time. Um, of course, mom's going to help build a wall, right? I think that we all have parents and, and my ego... A lot of that was developed by my mother, you know, and by our parents. I, my, I was raised by a single mom, mostly. My parents split. My mom did divorce my, my dad and my first stepdad, and then I had another stepdad. So th there was that as well. But you learn how to build a wall, you know. I love that, you know. You're just another brick in the wall, you know. It's easy to say that to people and point at people in your life and say, you're a brick in the wall. No, they just help you build a wall. And they help you corral your demons inside of that space is something that I've learned. To use some, you know, metaphor and artistry from rock and roll, really. That's where I've emotionally, this album has helped me process that stuff. Um, What's the next question he asks? Do you consider it biological and not from life experiences? You know, I, I, I don't know, man. I think it's a little bit of both. And there's also evidence to support that the biology of like depression, for example, if, if your parents struggle with depression or one of your parents struggles with depression, odds are you're gonna struggle with depression. Um, how much is that is learned behavior and how much of it is just genetics or biological? there's a bit of both and again we get into theories and there's it gets muddy people want certainty around these things i really don't think they're even here in 2023 there's not a lot of concrete physical evidence to support the fact that the fact right the clarity that um it's just all genetic man and you just need to take meds to 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 deal with the thing that you're was passed down to you by your parents. That's an easy out. And I'm not, and he, he mentions in here, that's, we'll go on to the next question. Um, so the only med you currently occasionally, occasionally is Bud Light. You know, it's more than occasionally. <laughs> I got Coors Light this time. I like Coors Light. I may be allergic to corn syrup. And they put corn syrup in Coors Light. I just like the taste of it, man. It's got, so what? It's got corn syrup in it. Corn is, I don't know. Anyway, but it's not like high fructose. It's not, I mean, it even says in the can, it's a, it's a natural kind of corn syrup. I mean, corn is in pretty much a lot of things that I enjoy. So <laughs> it's no wonder I would like Bud Light. But I digress. Um, 
Is alcohol a med for me? I don't know. Is coffee, right? I like to have a cup of coffee in the morning to get going. It brings my heart rate up or whatever. I don't know what it does. It just makes me awake. <laughs> I have a hard time in the morning. I'm not one of these guys that pops out of bed all chipper and ready to take on the day. Like, that's not me, man. I need a cup of coffee. I like a cup of coffee. Do I need a cup of coffee? If I'm going to work, it certainly is helpful. Um, I don't need it, need it. But I find that it does enhance my day, all right? And I enjoy the taste of coffee as well. I'm from Seattle. We got some of the best freaking coffee in the world here. So what's not to love about coffee? But I get it, you know, um, learning to adjust to the chemistry and the chemicals that we put in our bodies to cope sometimes. And that's a relationship as well. Like I have a relationship with caffeine. I have a relationship with alcohol and that relationship can be right another brick in the wall if I let it. That's another thing that Thracen said. I'm sure everyone's pegged you as straight edge. Definitely not straight edge. Your most insightful video went sort of unnoticed. Glad you overcame these problems at an early age. Um, you know, I did, as far as the, the chemical addiction stuff, I don't know, like, yeah, I guess I was a full-blown alcoholic at, at, as a teenager. That was the first thing. So the first thing was alcohol, and I was actually sent to rehab when I was 17 by the state of Washington. It was either Russ, you go to rehab, or you go to jail. And I'm like, I'll go to rehab. And it was outpatient rehab, so it wasn't like one of these things where you have to live there. But I did have to go every twice, three times, I think it was twice a week, three times a week. It might have been three times a week. I had to drive there, show up, I had to you know, sign in on a sheet of paper because if I didn't, it was to the clink with me. <laughs> or the juvenile clink at the time. It was funny because my mom had a Firebird and she was real busy and she had just got this like 1984 Firebird. It was used, but still it was cool. And uh, uh, I got to drive it. <laughs> the ironic thing about that is I didn't have a driver's license at the time. But my mom didn't really have another way to get me there. It wasn't that far from our house and just relax like she trusted me with the Firebird. And I didn't, I didn't get a ticket. So, right, I didn't get my in jail that would probably land me in jail as well but if she did what she could and i drove the car very responsibly <laughs> yes i went to rehab true story but even younger than that going through that i think the song that most that i heard first probably the whole world heard first from this album uh, and that hit me the the most was no poems no less poems everybody <laughs> The lad who reckons himself a poet. <laughs> Money, get back. I'm all right, Jack. Keep your hands off my stack. <laughs> New car, caviar, four-star daydream. Think I'll buy me a football team. <laughs> Absolute rubbish, laddies. Get on with your work. Repeat after me. The wall part one, the wall part two. We don't need no education talking about um i remember it was roger waters and some you know some reporter like corrals and like should you wrote a song about you know aren't you worried about your effect on the the youth and telling them that they don't need an education and he's like the song isn't about that the song is about abusive teachers right taking out or or projecting their own self-hatred and frustrations with life on their on the kids that they're supposed to be teaching hey teacher leave those kids alone all in all you're just another brick in the wall and that's something else i had to process you know it's not just right not just staying sober but not losing my freaking mind as a human being and and i had to go through some of that hurt as well because i you know, growing up ADHD and not just that, but dyslexic. Yeah, like in the second grade, I was held back because I wrote everything backwards. Like I wrote a paragraph down. You could hold it up to a mirror and read it. That's how bad it was. 
And still, it's like I'm still dyslexic. I'm just not like I can, I can write now, you know, stuff like that. But I didn't have to go to like special education and take a special class. I was like, Russ is dyslexic. And, and uh, yeah, some of that still comes back to this day. Like, it was actually the 70s when I was a kid that this started to come up. So we're talking late, mid to late 70s. Russ starts writing things backwards. And I was called stupid or can't pay attention. But I remember the teacher, one teacher in particular, that, that would, you know, name call, right? And I, I felt like an idiot. I didn't feel like I, I'm not going to learn this stuff. And then just starting to, and maybe, I don't know, teacher being overwhelmed or whatever, with a lot of kids in the classroom and this guy needing special attention. <laughs> right? The kid who wrote everything backwards, is that a six or a G? Right? Like they, I get it. But it doesn't mean you get emotionally project all of your crap onto the kids. And, and I experienced some of that. And that song was helpful for me. And it's not just that, but all of the relationships from the people who, not necessarily the people, but what they are suffering with and struggling with spraying out of them. There's so much that Im in imagery as well, you know, in, in the wall, the walking hammers, you know, to the, the big, you know, walking judge is a butt, right? <laughs> Makes, fills me with the urge to defecate. Um, and that's how I would land the plane. The, the Thrysen is the guy who, or, or the person, or a guy, I don't know. Like, the, the Thrysen, thank you for commenting because you brought some of this to mind and, and got my creative juices flowing as well. Um, but that's how the plane lands with the wall, right? And listen, I wanted to also say that this is just my understanding of this piece of work as I explain stuff. Like, I'm not telling you what to feel or what to think about a piece of music or art. There's some of these YouTube videos that are like, you know, the series Lost explained, you know, or Marvel's Avengers explained. Like, don't, what? Like, art is in the eye of the beholder. When someone makes a piece of art, it that's up to you to decipher and to distinguish and, and to process what it feels like and what it means to you and what does it mean to you that's what I'm curious about and I guess I don't, I don't know I get it some younger people when I was younger like I kind of want to know what what the heck lost was about that show was like I don't know um, but yeah when it comes to piece of music piece of art let your own psyche let your own ego spirit conglomeration define it for you not don't let you know some somebody let, let me tell you what this album's about I'm like oh, i can't stand that i have a hard time with that man tell you what um the trial the lyrics to the trial but my friend you have revealed your deepest fear i sentence you to be exposed before your peers tear down the wall and then there's this tear down the wall. I think for anyone who's whose life has come off the rails, you know, whether, you know, you, you finally got to the point where someone, you either got caught in living a, like a secret or a double life and, you, you know, you, you can't perform your job anymore because you're so addicted to whatever substance or whatever it is. That's that, man. That's the point. What do you do after that? What do you do after the judge has torn down the wall and you're seen as the vulnerable human being that you are? You aren't bulletproof. You're not a freaking Marvel hero. And even them, you know, like that's some of the, some of the artistry of Marvel, like superheroes going through stuff, right? Deal with your freaking stuff. That's what it's about. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Well, big thanks to the thrice, or the, I don't know how to pronounce it. I don't, I really don't know. <laughs> struggling with that. Thracen? 
thanks again. I, I, I genuinely appreciate you for making that comment. Uh, thanks for watching. If you're still watching right now, subscribe to the channel. If you haven't yet, uh, you made it this far. Appreciate you. Appreciate uh, the inquiry on my mental health. So thanks for stirring the creative juices in me. Appreciate that. Till next time.